Mr. President. The Senator from Missouri. Mr. President, I want to talk a little about the farm bill that will be on the floor, is on the floor that we'll vote on at some time uh, next week. I'd also predict, Mr. President, that this is uh, the last farm bill that won't be driven by the new realities of, of people uh, who want their food needs met in new ways. Those food needs are going to be uh, greater, but we're going to be less concerned, I would expect, five years from now about farm surpluses and what happens if we grow too much than we are about how we meet the, the growing uh, food needs of the world, partly because of population, partly because uh, people, once they get better food, just want the better food. Once you've got the variety of food, once you've had the experience of better food, nobody wants to go back to the food that they used to have. And we're going to see that driving this debate more over the next few years than we have up until now. Now, agriculture in many states, including my state of Missouri, is the number one um, industry in the state. 16 percent uh, of our workforce uh, is directly involved in agriculture. Uh, it continues in state after state. We, you and I have both heard it said that every senator represents an agri a, a, a agricultural state, and they do. Every senator represents a state where agriculture is a significant part of what we do, as it's always been part of what we do. Fewer people participate directly on the production end of agriculture, but of course everybody participates on the consumption end of agriculture. Uh, in uh, America, agriculture directly supports 16 million jobs just involved in how we grow and process what we have. Farm families in Missouri, farm families nationwide work each and every day to feed the country and more and more are focused on what it takes to also uh, feed the world. For two years now, we've been in a temporary a farm bill, and in some cases, uh, the, the, the assistance that government has given and will give again with the passage of this bill hasn't even been there for the last two years. When I talk in a few minutes about livestock disaster, that program went away in 2011 as we were facing some of the most difficult times uh, in, in a long time. The drought has been worse in many states than any time since the 1950s. Um, programs that would deal with that haven't dealt with that. But the investment in this bill really will reaffirm our commitment uh, to being at the forefront of productive agriculture. Uh, it will provide rural communities the ability to compete both here and abroad. Uh, and uh, certainly, Mr. President, it's not perfect. Uh, I think while it may not be the best possible bill, I'd say, as I said two years ago when I voted for that interim bill, uh, it's the best bill possible right now. And, and uh, as we all know, the, the uh, leaders on the Agricultural Committee in the House and the Senate have spent uh, a long time trying to bring this bill together. And if it was easy, they would have done it quicker. Uh, they didn't come back earlier than everybody else did after the recent break because they wanted to be back early. They came back because that, that discussion had not brought itself to a final bill yet. But this is the bill, and it does some good things. It provides a certainty and a safety net for farm families. Uh, I, there are very few farm families at some point in the productive cycle of a year don't have to go to the banker and say, we need to borrow some money to make something possible in this, this planning year that we couldn't do without borrowed money, and here's how we're going to pay it back. Well, here's how we're going to pay it back is a whole lot better if you say, and, and here's the safety net. Here's what happens if things that we don't expect to go wrong go wrong. Here's what happens if we have to actually use the crop insurance, and here's how we'll pledge to you that we'll, of course, have crop insurance when you make this loan. So this, this bill provides that and gives you a five-year place to look. I mean, my mom and dad were dairy farmers. I've, I, I have some sense of understanding how farm families work and think. Uh, and knowing how you can look at the rules and regulations five years in advance is a whole lot better than looking five months in advance or two years in advance. And we've gone through a period where uh, Farm families haven't known for a long time now what the long-term government commitment 
to agriculture is. Uh, and uh, when we pass this bill, we're going to have that longer commitment for the, long, for the first time in a while. This uh, supports our export opportunities. Uh, it finds ways that allow us to get more easily into markets that the people in those countries want us to be in. Because what we produce is something that they need, they want, they know they'd like to have it. Uh, USA stamped on a, uh, a, a, a truck, on a bin, on a, on, on a container, uh, is a seal of approval uh, all over the world. This expands bioenergy production, not for the bioenergy things that are out there already in a proven way, but expanding bioenergy in places we know it needs to be expanded. Uh, this is the bill that we invest in rural communities in. Uh, the, um, you know, 80% of this bill is now in nutrition programs that affect people uh, in the most urban parts of our country and in rural parts of our country, but the 20% that includes the, the crop insurance and other programs, I think crop insurance is about 4% of the entire bill here. We, we uh, see people who are critical of uh, how government is doing too much to help farm families, though they usually say, they usually assume that all farm families are somehow big corporate farmers. Uh, but this 4% or so of the bill is that. Uh, in the 20% that deals with rural America, it's things like economic development that allow people to continue to compete and be in rural America. This gives uh, our uh, colleges and universities, uh, and the land grants principally, but the non-land grants who have an agriculture mission, uh, the things that they need, the tools they need, and research. Uh, I think research is we're trying to figure out how to um, be sure that our products are as healthy and helpful to the people that consume them as possible is a good thing. Uh, and, and this bill does that by uh, securing at the same time some real cost savings. About $23 billion of deficit reduction uh, because of the reforms in this bill, things that we have done in the past that we no longer believe we have to do uh, for farm families to be competitive. I think five years from now, we can look at this again and assume that the world marketplace allows us to look at farm legislation in a new way. I'd like to discuss a couple of important issues that are addressed in this bill. One is research. The other is uh, livestock disaster assistance. Uh, uh, in 2012, about 80% of the agricultural land in America experienced a drought was the most extensive drought in our country since the 1950s. In, in, in Missouri, all 114 counties were declared disaster areas because of that drought. Many with uh, those uh, persistent dry conditions were uh, ranked among the very worst in the country. And we grow lots of livestock in our state, lots of livestock of all kinds, and particularly uh, in um, in cattle, beef and dairy cattle. Uh, we have livestock, we have other livestock that is a little easier to, to both categorize and contain and know everything you'd want to know about that, but uh, these industries didn't have uh, the kind of risk management programs they needed, and for whatever reason, uh, in the last farm bill, the livestock assistance programs, the livestock disaster programs, and that's all they are. They're not to help you in good times. They are purely to help you in bad times. Uh, those programs expired in 2011, just at the time uh, when we had some of the worst livestock conditions uh, that we've had in over 50 years. Uh, and so there was nothing there for those livestock producers. Uh, they were forced to liquidate their herds, resulting in the lowest cattle numbers since 1952. Now, what does that mean, the lowest cattle numbers since 1952? Does that just mean, what well, means we have fewer cattle, obviously, but it also means that the replacement of the herd is gonna be harder to do. Not as many mother cows, not as many calves. Beef prices on shelves in grocery stores will reflect these cattle numbers for a long time because people had to sell their herds and, and uh, our state alone, there are 300,000 fewer cattle in Missouri than there were uh, just a couple of years ago. It's the lowest number of cattle 
uh, in fact, a single year decline since the mid-1980s. And it takes a long time to come back from that decline and have uh, the numbers of cattle available for the feedlots and for buyers and for eventually the grocery store shelves that we would have had uh, otherwise. Um, I'm pleased that the Farm Bill makes these, per these programs permanent programs. Uh, but again, they're permanent programs that only occur if you have a, a extraordinary disaster circumstances that made them make them occur. Uh, research, thanks to smart investment and uh, research, uh, we have the safest, most affordable, and abundant food supply in the world. Smart investment and research, this goes back to, uh, this is not a new commitment by the federal government, it goes back to 1862 when President Lincoln signed the bill that created the Department of Agriculture. One of the principal purposes for the Department of Agriculture was research uh, that could be shared so that every farmer or every state or every community didn't have to do their own research, but research would be shared by the Department of Agriculture, encouraged by the Department of Agriculture, done in a way that it met uh, the needs of the whole country. and. Research continues to produce great results. In 1940, uh, one farmer fed 19 people. Uh, this year, one farmer feeds about 155 people. By 2050, a global food demand is expected to increase by about 70% and to double shortly after that. The, the American farmer is the best farmer in the world at producing quality products that are desired to meet that growing food need. If world food needs uh, double between now and some date shortly after 1950, Mr. President, that means we need to produce as much uh, food uh, in um, the second half of this century in any given year as we have produced uh, the 10,000 years of agricultural research has brought us to what we produce today. We need to double that in about the next 50 years. It's incumbent upon us to make sure we have the tools available to do that. Uh, as uh, the ranking member of the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, certainly research has been a critical thing that our committee has worked on, uh, and I'm glad that the Farm Bill authorizes these research programs and allows us to uh, continue to encourage research that allows us to do what we do, need to do to meet our own food needs and world food needs. Agriculture research uh, lets us have more efficient production, uh, ways to eradicate pests and disease. It addresses uh, the adverse weather conditions that the crops grow in. Uh, Africa as a continent is not grow, is not in the, the food production uh, role that they need to be in if by 2050 the projection is half of the people in the world uh, will live in Africa. But we, 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 it's in our best interest to see them produce more food as well. And of course, it's in our best interest uh, to maintain a safe food supply. Ag agricultural research can aid small farmers. We can see ag research that adds value uh, to staple crops in uh, and adds nutrients uh, to staple crops in countries that grow a crop that have a lot of it, but it just frankly may not have much value of food value, even though it may be most of what people eat. Uh, the uh, Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis conducts critical research to do just that, to, to look at a staple crop in a developing country and figure out what that crop could, uh, how that crop could uh, be, be uh, changed in a way that was beneficial to people uh, that are, are used to it, that can grow it, uh, but need to figure out how to select the best of those plants to replant the next year. Uh, research into nutrient, for, uh, nutrient fortification, drought resistance and disease and other things are important. The Farm Bill takes that step. Uh, the chairwoman of the committee and the ranking member of the committee, uh, our friends, the senators from Michigan and Mississippi, have worked hard to bring this bill forward. And I would just close by saying again, I predict that as world food needs um, and 21st century opportunities for agriculture change, that's gonna define the debate five years from now, well below what we are likely to anticipate right now. It's no longer gonna be a world that's driven about uh, what, uh, how do we sell the crops we grow, 
I think it's going to be much more driven by how do we grow the crops that the world needs and Americans need, uh, and how do we connect that result to the marketplace that needs it. This uh, uh, American farmers for a long time have struggled with uh, how productive they were in a world that maybe didn't need everything we could grow. I think that's not going to be the case uh, very in the very near future, and I believe by the time we get to the end of this five-year farm bill, we're going to have a very different discussion about how we meet our own food needs and world food needs and the great opportunity uh, in agriculture and agriculture business and competition that nobody is better at than the American farmer. And I intend to support this bill next week.